Hello. Welcome to my talk about the paper with the title Telesto, a graph neural network model for anomaly classification in cloud services. This is a joint work with my colleague Alexander Acker and presented at the AIOps workshop, which is co-located with the International Conference on Service-Oriented Computing. Here I present you the outline of our talk. We will start with a motivation followed by the problem description. Then we will present the envisioned approach together with the experiment design and our conducted evaluation. We will then also name if here encountered limitations and summarize our talk with a conclusion. Modern IT systems become and became increasingly complex, for instance, in terms of deployment and maintenance. This is why monitoring systems are often employed to collect metrics. If they are sampled in a reasonable interval, they provide information about the system state to some kind of extent. Then methods can be used to do analysis of such metrics, for instance, in order to do anomaly detection, anomaly classification or root cause analysis. Given the presented background, a common workflow for systems is to collect metrics from target systems, then choose a method which seems reasonable and train it based on the collected metrics and then use the trained model or method in a production environment. And this is also very reasonable and usually in a static setup, this raises no problems. However, what happens now if the respective target system is updated or the employed and trained method should be used on a different system with either the same metrics but a different ordering or most metrics being the same and a few of them are there additionally? What usually needs to be done then is to retrain the model from scratch and this does not always seem very smart. So the question is, can we do better? And this is what we try to investigate with the present work. The previously mentioned problems can be entirely described with the following two aspects. First, many established methods assume a static dimensionality of the input data. However, the number of metrics might change in the context of IIOps, for instance, due to software updates or hardware modernization. And second, many established methods are not permutation invariant. So if the ordering of incoming metrics or data in general might change, then there is a problem. And this can certainly happen due to fetching or pre-processing or any other step before the data actually arrives at the respective method. This is why our approach proposes an interpretation of the input data samples as graphs. Graphs have some very convenient properties and graph structured data has certain advantages. On the one hand, most methods operating on graphs can deal with varying graph sizes. And as you will see in a second, this solves the issue of assumed static dimensionality that we have discussed earlier. Also, each node is able to have a varying number of neighbors and is not bound to a fixed set of neighbors. And so this also contributes to the solution that is no longer bound to a static dimensionality. And lastly, the concept of order does not really exist. So this introduces permutation invariance. This will all be explained more on the next slide, but the general idea of ours is let us model the multivariate time series as an attributed graph for more flexibility. And we are talking here about multivariate time series because if we have our metrics or KPIs and we are collecting them and sampling them constantly over time, we can also define them in terms of a multivariate time series. We propose the following graph modeling. Each observed variable of our multivariate time series becomes a node in our graph. Actual observations are becoming node features, and to actually obtain multiple graphs, we extract subseries of the multivariate time series. Since we do not know the relationships between the variables beforehand, we construct fully connected graphs and attempt to learn the importance of neighbors later. Below, you will find an example of how to construct a graph out of a multivariate time series. We define a window size F and a stride 
and we are moving the window size along the temporal dimension of the multivariate time series. In our example, we are having the variables i and j, and we are extracting subseries from them. Now, on the right side, you can see how we obtain the graph. So each observed variable becomes a node. This is why we have vi and vj. And also, each node has the node features, xi and xj, and both have as many values as there are observations within our window size, which is, as I just said, f. And so this we would do for every, every subseries. And here is it depicted for the very first window that we are extracting. But just for completeness, three subseries correspond to three graphs. And the window size determines how much context is captured in our graph. Since we have described how to obtain graph samples given a multivariate time series, we can now proceed and propose our architecture, which makes use of multiple already existing graph methods and combines them. It can be explained in three steps. In general, our methods operates on the node feature matrix. That is, given a graph with n nodes and each node having f features, this is a matrix of size n times f. So the first step is called temporal feature extraction. And here we are employing several techniques. The first one is we are adding a positional encoding to our node features so that they have some underlying temporal dependency that our convolutional layer that we use subsequently can pick up and extract meaningful features. We are also employing some regularization here since we have not so many data in our test bed and we don't want to overfit on some features. The second step is called graph transformation, and this is where we actually employ graph methods for the first time. So in general, most graph methods implement the message passing scheme. This is each node receives messages from its neighbors. And usually these messages are just the respective node features. And then these messages are aggregated in a predefined way to update the own local node features. So here we are employing a method that we call techconfere, and it, would, it was proposed in the corresponding paper. And this method explores the k-hop neighborhood of respective nodes and computes new node features based on this exploration. So that one is quite powerful, and we are using multiple layers here subsequently. Meanwhile, the output of each techconf layer is passed to a getconf layer. This is a different graph convolutional layer, and this one explores the direct neighborhood. And this is based on self-attention. So this layer will learn the importance of a connection between two nodes based on their transformed node features. So we use these both methods together because the first one can explore a, a far bigger neighborhood and incorporate this information. And the second one will operate on these already updated node features and calculate the importance of neighbors to uh, increase and to improve the node, fe node features even more. Finally, we are collecting the outputs of the respective getconf layers across all levels of our graph transformation procedure and combine them in a clever way using jumping knowledge. So jumping knowledge is another graph method and it will learn a weighted average of our node feature matrices also based on an attention mechanism. After exploring and exploiting the respective neighborhoods and the graph in general, we can proceed with step three, which is graph representation and classification. So the updated node features are subject to a final feed forward neural network, a simple neural network with two linear transformations, which just gives the model the capability of, if required, transform the node features even more to optimize for some target task, which is in our case classification. 
eventually we need to apply a global pooling because we need some res representation for each graph and therefore we are using global attention here with learnable attention weights to compute a weighted average of all nodes in the respective graph to get a representation. Finally, we are after employing some more regularization. We are using a linear layer to optimize for the classification task. We are then employing a softmax layer to derive at a probability distribution. And this one is then used with our loss function. In summary, our architecture looks exactly like this. So here we having all three steps in one picture. In order to evaluate our method, we require some realistic data. So our experiment design looks like this. We are running two applications in a self-hosted deployed cloud infrastructure. This is OpenStack on a 21 node commodity cluster. We are running, as I just said, two applications. One is a virtual IMS. The second one is a content streaming service. And there's also a link to the repository describing the whole setup. We are then having different anomaly types and we are synthetically injecting them at runtime into respective service components and also hypervisors. And here we are using a group based injection policy. So each anomaly is injected five times into each group. And so all instances of a service component are into one group, all hypervisors are one group and so on and so on. And lastly, we are using monitoring agents and we are deploying them to collect the metrics that we desire. And here is a table of the five anomalies that, that we have designed and they, that we have synthetically injected at runtime. For the pre-processing, we are using the leaf one group out cross validata and we are splitting the data into training validation and test data. This assures that there's at least one sequence of each anomaly in each subset. We then employ min-max normalization of the input data based on the training set. Since each recorded anomaly sequence has a length of four to five minutes, we are constructing our graph samples with a window width of 20 and in a stride of one. This assures that there's at least some context captured in our graphs while we still keep the feedback loop small. For the training, we are using a GPU. The implementation is done with PyTorch and PyTorch Geometric. Since we have five anomalies and we want to predict which anomaly is currently present, this is a multi-class problem. We are evaluating five splits of our data. We repeat each experiment 10 times to cancel out the effects of unfavorable weight initialization and the number of training epochs is set to 15. In order to assess the goodness of our proposal, we are compared to two other often used graph models. And this is to see how our approach and also the other comparative models are doing on multivariate time series modeled as graphs. So the first comparative model is the GCN model or the GCN operator proposed in the respective paper. It's a common benchmark. And uh, yeah, the convolution layer was introduced in 2016. And in our evaluation, we implemented the GCN architecture similar to, similar to the one that was used in the respective paper. As you can see on the right, this is basically a three-step architecture. So the first one is graph transformation, where the actual GCN layer is used. Then there is some graph representation. So in this case, we are just adding all features across all nodes. And then step three is mainly classification and employing some linear transformation to optimize the classification process. The second comparative model is the GIN model or the GIN graph convolutional layer. In the respective paper, the authors showed state-of-the-art results both for node and graph classification on several benchmark datasets. And we have implemented with an architecture similar to the GCM before. So we have also three steps here, graph transformation, graph representation and classification. We are now presenting the results on the Cassandra dataset. This is all 
injected anomalies into the Cassandra service component of one of the two deployed applications. What we can see here is that our approach outperforms both comparative models that we can clearly see here with the F1 score. However, there are also big differences in between the respective data splits. This is not super surprising because we only have five injections for each anomaly, and so there can be a lot of variance in between. For the sake of completeness, we are now presenting the results of our approach on all other service components. We are presenting accuracy scores here. What we can see is that across all service components, there is quite a lot of variance. For instance, on Cassandra, we have almost 85% accuracy, whereas on the Homer service component, it's only around 60%. And also in between splits, the changes can be quite dramatic. So this is again due to the limited A data that we had available, but it also shows that each injected anomaly, at least with this amount of data, is quite unique and has very own characteristics. We are now presenting and discussing the limitations that we have encountered during our evaluation. First, the limited amount of data is certainly a point here. And we have already seen this in the tables before, that there are tremendous differences in between splits. So this uh, definitely limited our model and in many cases we also overfitted on the presented data. Second, the temporal dependence between consecutive graphs is not given, so the original dependence of the extracted subseries is lost in the process of optimizing for the classification task. And so this is certainly a pro problem. And also fully connected graphs are introducing problems because most methods operating off on graphs are expecting a reasonable relationship between nodes. And if we're just connecting all nodes with all other nodes, this is certainly not the case. In conclusion, our approach Telesto was able to outperform two conventional graph convolutional neural networks on specific data sets. Specific data sets, they were constructed by modeling multivariate time series as graphs. We assume this is mainly because of our combination of temporal and spatial convolution and feature extraction. We have seen that modeling time series as graphs has certain advantages. On the one hand, most methods operating on graphs are invariant to dimensionality changes. So if there is one more node, which corresponds to one observed variable in a multivariate time series. It's just an additional node with outgoing and ingoing connections. And also, since there is no ordering of nodes, this modeling approach is invariant to permutations. But also, modeling time series as graphs has some problems that we have seen. For instance, for now, the temporal information can get lost. And in our case, it is lost. And also the idea of fully connected graphs irritates many graph methods because they assume a reasonable connectivity of the nodes in a graph. In a direct comparison, our method is inferior to methods like GIU or LSTMs, so methods that are specifically optimized for sequential data. And so there is still work to be done to improve this. Thank you very much for listening to my presentation and I wish you a wonderful day.